You're listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, the weekly podcast with me, Alexander Schacht, and Benjamin Pieske, designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science, and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. Today we are talking again about leadership and about how we can build organizations of leaders and what's a big benefit about this. So stay tuned with this discussion with Claude Petit. Claude is a really, really interesting statistician. She has done some additional work on becoming a really, really good leader. And we will talk about this and her passion for building leaders and uh, being an effective leader in the discussion today. You know, I'm really, really passionate about leadership. That's also one of the reasons why I have my leadership program, the Effective Statistician Leadership Program, together with Gary Sullivan. If you want to learn more about this, then head over to our homepage. Welcome to another episode of The Effective Statistician. Today I'm talking with Claude Petit. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Very good. So we just had a little bit of an introductory talk, but for the listener, uh, can you explain a little bit how your career has looked like and then what you're doing now? Sure. So as I'm sure you can hear, you know, but I don't have an American accent. So my career started in France. I actually moved to the U.S. 15 years ago uh, with Boringer Ingeheim. And my background is in statistics. Um, I started as a statistician a long time ago. And I've been working for different CROs and different pharma companies. And my PhD was in Bayesian statistics, which at that time was very, very new. You know, it's not anymore, but that was very controversial when, when I did my PhD. And I remember this heated debate about Bayesian statistics. So I spent 17 years at BI. And then last summer, um, I changed jobs. And in between jobs, I decided to go back to school. So actually, I went back to the American University and became a certified coach, uh, executive coach. And I must say, I had a lot of fun doing that. You know, I, I never thought I would have so much fun going back to school. And, and then in October, I started working again. And I'm now the, the VP for biostatistics and statistical programming at Astellas. Um, so I still is in Chicago, but I'm still in Connecticut and I'm working remotely from home. Very good. That also means there's one hour time difference less to, to Europe, uh, which I think is, is quite, quite nice. But of course, one hour time difference more to Japan, <laughs> yes. which, which is uh, important for a Japanese company. So um, when you went back to a university what made you go back to there and and become a coach and, and especially kind of in terms of of a coach about leadership yeah so you know first i've always enjoyed learning new things and you know as i'm from france i never went to school in the us so i was very curious about the university system in in the us and, and mm -hmm. i wanted to learn about it And, you know, being a leader for me was all about developing the people and taking care of them and finding ways to motivate them and communicate with them. So I really thought, you know, becoming a coach is actually a nice way um, to do that, to achieve that. And being a leader, I was... Always, I always thought I was coaching as well. You know, I would define mm -hmm. myself as a leader and a coach. But actually, when I did that training, um, I understood that I was more like a mentor um, rather than a coach. And being a coach is actually very difficult and, and very rewarding. And that's something that, you know, as everything else, you need to learn the techniques and you need to learn how to do it to be good at it. 
And what, what's for you more a mentor versus a coach? Yeah, so the, the way I understand it is a mentor is basically you tell people stories about what you've done and how you've done it. And maybe you try to inspire them how, you know, they could, you know, lead their career or solve the issues. Um, being a coach is very different. Uh, being a coach is really about helping people finding the solutions themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of asking questions and, and making people think and, and help them find the potential that they have, which is sometimes deep inside, and, and help them find solutions. Mm -hmm. So it's very nice because I think it, it builds people for the long term to become independent and, and to find solutions even when you're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can completely see that. And of course, if you have done it, been there, it's very easy to tell a story and kind of show, oh, I've done that this way in the past. But that gives a quick fix, but it doesn't necessarily help them to maybe develop other areas uh, go different paths that might be actually more successful and also kind of, yeah, have their own mistakes and create their own stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very good. Um, speaking a little bit more about leadership, what, what actually is leadership for you? Yeah. So, so for me, really being a leader, the first thing is to create a safe space, you know, for mm -hmm. the employees so that they can, they, they can really give their best and they feel like you have their back and, and you're going to be there to support them regardless of, of the outcome. Mm -hmm. And it's, what's important for me is that, you know, in the end, um, people can reach their potential and they can develop themselves. And of course, it's a win-win for the company and, and the employee. And that's really what, what it is about. It's providing um, a safe space and enough direction so that people know, you know what they should do and they can really give their best. Why is that safe space that you started with, why is that so important? What, what does that achieve? Well, I think if you're not in a safe space, then you're going to spend most of your time um, protecting yourself mm -hmm. and making sure that nothing bad happens to you. And that's not where you're going to be innovative. That's not where you're going to take risks. Mm -hmm. That's not where you're trying to be outside your comfort zone. It's exactly the opposite. You know, you're going to keep doing the same things again and again, the way you know it's going to work. You're going to make sure that every step is covered. So most likely not try to accelerate anything or try anything new. And for me, that's exactly the opposite of what we should be doing in the pharma industry. Yeah. So if there's not this safe space, you make it safe yourself by playing it safe. By doing exactly what, what you're told, by kind of checking in on every step that you're making, uh, always covering your back and, and never, you know, step, step out of the line. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, how do you create that safe space? Well, I think it's really a matter of, of trust. You know, it's something mm -hmm. that takes time for sure. And it's really how you, you behave, I would say. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's great to talk about something. It's even better to demonstrate it. So it's really, you know, when issues happen, how you're going to react and how you're going to be supporting your staff. When um, there are difficulties, how you're going to coach them, you know, to find the, the right solutions. And I think it's also a company culture, you know, and I'm, I'm very happy to work for Astellas because 
I think they have this culture, uh, especially being a Japanese company. Um, you know, in Japan, it's a lifetime employment. Yeah. So people join Astellas when they're very young, fresh out of school, and they spend their whole life there. So it's a big decision for them when they decide to work for such a company. And so the company in return um, is providing this safe space and you know, a chance for employees to have a happy business life. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important to, to, to have that. Yeah, I, I agree that it's really important. Um, and I love that you started with, with trust. I completely agree. Trust is the, the fundament uh, there. And if you show that you care for the people, that um, you have that back, you, you show your character, yeah. Um, these are really important parts and, and also that you have the competence to coach them and, and to, to move them forward as, as a supervisor um, are fundamental things. And as you said, um, you can talk a lot, but what it really kind of changes the needles is, is when push comes to shove, how you act. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I find it interesting when people speak about communication It's so much about the words you say or the, the words you write. I think how you behave sends much stronger communication signals than, than you know, all the speeches that you do. Yeah, no, I agree. And how you make people feel as well, I think mm -hmm. it's very important. You know, beyond words, it's, it's really, we're all humans and we all want to be recognized and valued for the work we do and respected. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, the way you make people feel is, is more important than anything else. Yes, very good. How do you make them feel valued and recognized? Well, I think there are, you know, first, I really believe in constant feedback. So, you know, I don't think that we should talk to people twice a year when they have a, <laughs> a performance review. Uh, hopefully, we can, we can discuss with them more often than that. So, it's, it's really by providing the good and maybe the opportunity feedback as well. Mm -hmm. That's going to help them. And it's also about, you know, giving them the credit they deserve. So, you know, as a leader, I'm not doing any work by myself anymore. So I always make sure that people understand who was behind the scene and who actually did the work and who should be recognized for it. Um, and it's, it's very important that people know that what they do is seen and understood. Yeah. There's nothing worse than, as a supervisor, taking the credits that belongs to the team. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That um, completely destroys trust really, really fast. Completely agree. Um, feedback is also a really important point. How do you provide feedback? I think what I'm really struggling with is feedback in our remote settings yeah. yeah i love giving feedback but but having the opportunity to observe behavior that i can give feedback about is not that often yeah, yeah. so of course maybe i see something like a email or a presentation or something like this mm -hmm. but um Of course, I don't sit, you know, next to them to give them constant feedback all the time. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so it, it's, of course, it's easier face-to-face, -face, you know, mm -hmm. like you would go to a meeting and right after the meeting, you would give like for two or three minutes, you know, some quick feedback and, and that's easy to do. Now you can't do that anymore. So you have to find other ways. Um, you know, I, I do use I am a lot. Mm -hmm. So like if, if we are in a meeting or at the end of a meeting, you can, I am, you know, uh, the, the people, of course, not trying to distract them when they are presenting, uh, but afterwards. And 
you know, if it's positive feedback, you know, just a, a simple I am saying that was fantastic, you did great. Um, people really, really like it. Um, if it's more constructive feedback, I think it's better to have a discussion. Um, so what I'm trying to do now is to have these very quick meetings, like five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, and as close as possible to the event. So yeah. you don't want to give feedback three weeks later. I think that's, that's a little bit, you know, too long. So again, I'm using the IM and, you know, saying, hey, when you have five minutes, just give me a phone call and, and then we'll discuss it. And I think that's very efficient. Yeah, I, I, I also really love the phone call thing. So it's a very quick thing to just say, are you okay to get some feedback? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, say, oh, you did this and that had this good impact or this bad impact. Yeah. And um, I agree. It's a three to five minute thing. It's more about doing that consistently rather than, you know, doing it. Uh, yeah, for sure. Not just once or twice a year. Yeah. So absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I'm the first one to recognize that getting feedback is not always easy. Um, you know, if it's positive feedback, of course, we love it. <clears throat> but constructive feedback sometimes is, is a little bit more difficult to accept. So in return, um, I also want to show people that I'm very open to feedback myself. And if I do something wrong or something that could be done better, then own it, you know, apologize for it or correct it and, and just move forward. Yeah. That's a really good point. And I think that also shows if you have built this trust with your, with your people and you get these kind of feedback, then that is really something that, that helps you to, to adjust and to, and to correct. And um, I always was, was very, very open about these things. And it has helped me quite a lot to, to improve, to, to adjust. Yeah, and sometimes also possibly to, to give certain kind of additional background on things yeah so maybe you did a didn't communicate a decision clearly enough and why you have taken it that way yeah because then maybe you know person didn't understand um because from their point of view it didn't make sense and they didn't have the whole context so people then question you and are you know as you mentioned earlier have that safe space to to call you out on it that's 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 really really good and it helps so much with co company culture so if we think about us as statisticians why is it so important for us to be leaders so i think the the way i see it and being a, a statistician myself i really think statisticians have unique skills um, in the pharma industry and there is a lot they can do to help the other functions. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think statisticians are usually part of a core team and they're working with different functions, mm -hmm. uh, scientific, non-scientific, medical, non-medical. And I really think that they can be the bridge between all these different functions and, and make sure that there is a, a good communication. But... I think what statisticians have is this ability to understand the context and to translate it into a scientific question or into a trial design. And they see what's going to be needed to have the evidence, you know, in, in the end to draw a conclusion. Yeah, I think what we very often take for granted is our skill to conceptualize things yeah. to move it into some you know data space into kind of some some study design data space um which we have learned over you know years and years and years um and it's we we are kind of it's it's kind of the air that we breathe we don't kind of realize it yeah. um and i think being aware about the strengths and utilizing it is, is really important. Where do you see statisticians typically struggle with in terms of, you know, 
convincing others on, on their point of view in terms of these data things, for example? Well, I think, unfortunately, there is still sometimes the thinking that you call the statistician when you have to write the statistical section in the <laughs> protocol. So they are late in the game, which makes it very difficult for them to give an input that will be impactful. So I, I really hope this can change. And I think statisticians have to fight to really have a seat at the table early on so that they can have a, a real impact. And I think they also have to find a way to, you know, at, we all have these T-shaped skills, okay? So we have mm -hmm. very deep technical skills, uh, which obviously is part of a job. But sometimes we also have to broaden a little bit the T and understand what the medical questions are, understand the disease, understand the patients, how they feel, what's meaningful for them. And I really think if statisticians could make that effort sometimes to learn beyond the technical skills, um, that would help them really be part of a development team and have a real influence um, on the drug development plan, which I think is, is where we should be spending our time. You know, understand not just one child, but what is a strategy to get a drug approved? Yeah, what is a strategy to get approved? What are the internal processes all, yeah? I was very often able to you know, drive things forward because I knew how to get things approved. Yeah. Who to ask for, who, what are the committees, all these kind of different things. Whereas the physicians I was working with, they were great from a you know medical point of view, but they had no clue in terms of how that runs within the business. Yeah. And having this business know-how can make you give you a great advantage over over others yeah and so um that's another point and as you mentioned kind of understanding the patient understanding the regulatory landscape understanding the the hda landscape yeah what what will it take to get this uh product successful to the market and what is what's the competition that it will likely hit yeah yes Uh, having this external view is, is also really important. Yeah, yeah. So if we would have a statistics organization that would be full of these statistical leaders, these people that are both, you know, that have a strong T, both, you know, deep and wide in terms of knowledge and leadership, what would that look like? What would be the, you know, the success from an organizational perspective? Well, I think really now, the, you know, it's so complicated to get a drug developed and approved. It's all about collaboration. Mm -hmm. So it's really all about people working together and complementing each other's. So I think if a statistician is there and can facilitate this communication and this dialogue, that, that would make a big difference, even among the quantitative functions, I would say, because now we have, you know, biomarker specialists, we have translational medicine, we have, you know, early uh, statistics, late statistics. So I think it's, it's good to make sure that all these people work together and, and that they are on the same page as well. And, you know, the, the other thing is um, we've all been in that situation that when we work on a drug, we get very attached to that drug. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult when the drug is not doing well, maybe to make the right decisions. And I think Good. that's where, yeah. <laughs> you know, the statisticians maybe are more fact-based and evidence-based. I'm not saying they're not attached to the drug as well, because I'm sure they are, but I think that's where they can play a big role and really put the evidence together so that the right decisions are made at the right time. And the way I see it is that really when you discontinue a drug, I see it as a success. 
And the way why I see it as a success is because you're going to be able to use these people and the money you have for another drug that is more promising. And you're not wasting patients' time as well with a drug that will not deliver. Yeah. So I think it's it's where I really want the statisticians to contribute and to help the company make the right decision. I completely agree. It's all about accumulating the right evidence over time. Yeah. Initially, it's for internal decision making. Later, it is for regulatory decision making. And ultimately, it's for decision making with payers, physicians, and patients. And um, if we overall, as statisticians, are much more successful, um, I think we can actually, for also from an organizational point of view, can play a much bigger role across the industry. Yeah, I think um, we don't need to be kind of then cornered in some kind of operational areas. Yeah, or um, we won't be in the position that, you know, we have this effect like, as you said, well, we call the statistician when, when we need to write the statistical plan. If we are collectively better uh, in terms of leadership, that will create a halo effect for everybody working in the organization. And it will speed up uh, things for everybody. It will make things easier for everybody. And I think it will be also easier, for example, to get the resources that we need, to get the trainings that we need, to, to you know, have automatically a seat at the table where these things are discussed. And Ultimately, I think it will also make us more successful to transition out of statistics. Yeah, I think um, if we as statisticians are becoming collectively better leaders, then it will be also much more attractive for other functions to hire statisticians and make them VP of regulatory or you know, the, the, the head of the R&D area, or maybe one time a CEO, yeah? Right. So why not, yeah? What, what, where is written that that needs to be someone from marketing or sales or someone from finance or, you know, a biologist, yeah, or a chemist? Why can't yep. it be a statistician, yeah? At Lilly, one of the statisticians became the CIO, and was reporting into the CEO. So, yeah, if a statistician can go that, why not? Yeah. yeah. Our industry is so much more driven by data across all these different things. You know, if you think about marketing, sales, that's a lot about data driven things. If you yes. think about medical affairs, it's a lot about data driven things. If you think about, um, yeah, all the finance procurement stuff. That's anyway data in its purest form. Yeah. It's it's data wherever you go. And see the the times where kind of we went out with slogans and you know sold our drugs based on slogans is far gone. Yeah. So um I think there's ample opportunities for statisticians, but I think we need to as functions become much better in terms of leadership. And then there's a, you know, we can raise the tide and raise, so then all boats, you know, are getting, uh, getting higher. So that was a little bit me on a soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think about that? About statisticians becoming CEOs? <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know if if most of them would like it first because I think maybe the you know the the mindset is a little bit different. But what I think is that right now companies are not benefiting from the statisticians as much as they should, mm -hmm. and and I think um, statisticians are really underused and. You know, we're all trying to be quicker. You know, first, the, the patients are there waiting. 
Mm. But I guess we also want to make money and, and be the first one to the market. And, and I see many companies trying to shave some days here and there. And can you lock your database quicker? And can the medical writer write you know, the CSR faster? But for me, that's not what's going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. um, the difference, again, is really when you build this clinical development plan and when you design the trial, how can you be faster? How can you collect the evidence in a way that maybe you do less trials or you need a smaller sample size or you have less space between trials and you can transition much faster? And that's where I think statisticians can do a lot for the companies. Yep, completely agree. It doesn't matter in the end if you deliver the results two or three days after database log. Yeah. That will not, you know, change things. But if you can, you know, shorten the recruitment time by 50%, yeah, yeah. that's a topic. If you can uh, decrease the placebo uh, rate by 50%, yeah. That's a topic. If you can get rid of a complete study, mm -hmm. that will make a change. Yeah? yeah. Or if you can say, well, we move that study out to, to pass the approval. Yeah. These things will, will make a change. I completely agree. It's the same also uh, later on if, um, if you have the drug approved. Yeah. Can you create evidence really, really fast? without running new studies? Or can you set up uh, observational research so that you can, from these kind of research, you can very, very fast answer any analysis, yeah? Without first going through kind of six different hoops that takes, takes you six months to get to an answer, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's really about utilizing, I think, the totality of evidence. And now we have this real world data, which, you know, it's not perfect yet. And we all know that, but it has some value. And if it's used the right way, I think that that can play a big role. And I really think the statisticians also have to learn to work with this kind of data because, you know, clinical trial data and real world data really complement each other's. And that's a nice package that can be used to gain some time or maybe to avoid running some trials as well. I completely agree. I think there's, there's so much different data sources that we can use. Yeah, It's the clinical trials. It's maybe combining clinical trials with real-world evidence, real-world evidence alone. It's indirect comparisons. Um, and sometimes, you know, things like... Uh, just a patient survey mm -hmm. helps quite a lot, yeah? And you can run this very cheap, very, very fast. And that may give you, give you an answer. So from my point of view, as a statistician, we should have all these different evidence sources in mind um, and not just the few studies that we set up ourselves. Very, very good. So if we think about leadership, going back to that topic, what's your number one tip to become a statistical leader? Well, for me, it's really about leaving your comfort zone and, and become visible. So um, I think the statisticians are still too much invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, people kind of know they exist People kind of know or think they know what they do. Um, but I think it's really our job to explain what we do, to explain what we could do and that we're not doing yet yeah. and, and how we could benefit. And it's not arrogance or anything like that, but it just makes sure people understand, you know, the potential that, that we have and trust us so that they let us use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I completely agree. It's, it has nothing to do with arrogance, yeah? Um, if you explain, for example, to your sales marketing organization, to your 
pricing and reimbursement organization, to your medical affairs organization, to your toxicology organization, how you can help them, I would turn it around. It's a disservice if you don't. Yeah, because then you leave them alone with their problems and they might think, oh, let's Google my problem. Yeah. Oh, there's some kind of company that can help me with that. And they go to some kind of random CRO where, you know, just picking up the phone and calling the statistician would have helped them directly. Yeah. So um, having a good internal marketing for you personally but also for your uh, organization, I think is a must have for, for statisticians to have. And um, yeah. And then you can then show what you can help and how you can help and how you actually understand them and where the pain points are. Absolutely. And, and unfortunately, most statisticians are not very good at that, you know, at, at explaining what they could do at maybe branding themselves a little bit and showing, you know, the potential of all these techniques and all these data we have access to. Yeah. Yes, there's usually some statisticians in the organizations that really love doing that. If they do that more, you know, if they have more time for that, that's a good thing. There's actually one thing that I think statisticians are really good at um, that's is training, training others on statistics. Yes. And that is also, I think, a great marketing tool. Yeah. So, for example, I don't know, there's a new phase two study that has a readout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't just let the physicians talk about it. Yeah. Explain as statisticians what these data mean. And explain why your phase two study looks different than the competition. Yeah. It becomes even more important when you get to the phase three results because then you reach an even yes. bigger audience. Yeah. Don't just let it to the to the others to, to talk about the data. Talk about the data from your perspective. Talk about their strengths, their limitations. What does does that actually mean, this hazard ratio thing? Yeah. I've worked with lots of physicians that were were more than happy to invite the statisticians as well to, to, you know, partner up and speak about these things. And that's, uh, I think that's a unique opportunity that we have. I agree. I think that really medical and, and statisticians teaming up you know, that's a very strong team for sure. And, you know, you make sure that they are understood the right way and that they have the right impact too. But also if there are limitations that people understand them, mm-hmm. you know, because it's not always perfect. And I think in integrity, which in the pharma industry is, is a number one, is very important. And the statisticians, you know, can explain that too. I think that is also a big asset that we have. Whenever I talked, for example, to key opinion leaders, I had the feeling they trusted me as a statistician much more than they trusted other functions. That's an asset that we should bring to the table. Yeah. Um, also because we can make, you know, complex data be understood easy, which also helps with building trust. Yeah. And so these things are really, really important in our business. And they will only grow in importance, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have more and more data, as you were saying before. And so I think the, the, the job of statisticians has a very bright future ahead of them, for sure. Thanks so much. That was a very, very good final sentence. Um, Thanks so much for coming on. We talked so much about leadership, about your leadership journey, about coaching versus mentoring, what it actually means to be a statistician, what it, you know, why providing a safe space is so important for for improving speed, for innovation, for creative ideas. 
Um, we talked a lot about what a statisticians organization says is full of strong leaders, how that can turn the needle around. And it's not about this, you know, one day here or there that you can carve out, but really about the, the, the bigger things. And that it's, um, yeah, really important to keep stepping outside of your comfort zone. Yes, absolutely. Much. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video-on-demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars, and much, much more. The reduced rate is only £20 for non-high-income countries and £95 for high-income countries. Head over to psiweb.org to learn more and become a PSI member today.